I tore my knee meniscus. Now what? Hello, this is Dr. Grant Cooper from Princeton Spine and Joint Center. In today's video, I'd like to talk to you about one of the most common causes of knee pain, meniscus tears. I'm going to talk to you about what constitutes a meniscus tear, some little known facts about meniscus tears, how you know if a tear is causing your pain, and what are the treatment options for a symptomatic tear from different exercises you could do on your own to injection options, to regenerative medicine, to meniscus transplants, and other surgeries. But first, I've been reminded, and yes, threatened, that I'm being negligent if I don't ask you to please remember to like this video, assuming you do like the video, and I hope you will, and to please subscribe to our channel to help us continue to grow. Okay, let's get on to what I would really like to be talking to you about, the meniscus. First, what is it? The meniscus is a C-shaped pad of cartilage inside of the knee. The meniscus acts as a shock absorber for the knee. Now your knee has two menisci, one on the medial or inside of the knee and one on the lateral or outside of the knee. The meniscus help protect the knee and keep it healthy by acting as a shock absorber and a cushion. Unfortunately, the meniscus can also tear and become painful. But, and this is a really important point to make here, so please listen up. This is something that every healthcare practitioner who deals with knee pain should know, but unfortunately a lot seem to have missed the message. But so now, whether you're a healthcare provider or not, you'll know this very important point about meniscus tears. You ready? Here it is. Lots of people have meniscus tears and don't even know about it. That is, lots and lots of people don't have any knee symptoms, and yet if you look on an MRI of their knee, you will see a meniscus tear. Now, how many people are walking around with asymptomatic meniscus tears? Well, to be honest, the exact number is hard to pin down because different studies differ a bit. The older you are, certainly the more likely you are to have an asymptomatic meniscus tear, that's for sure. By the time you're 60, most people who have zero knee pain will still have a meniscus tear in their MRI um, if you were to get an MRI for whatever reason. Let me throw some interesting studies and facts at you so that we can fill out the picture. One study looked at 57 patients with symptomatic knee meniscus tears. The patients in this study were between the ages of 18 and 73 with an average age of 43. The study took an MRI of the asymptomatic knee. So just to recap so far, the folks in the study were people with symptomatic knee meniscus tears in one knee, and now the study is looking at MRIs of the opposite knee, which have no symptoms. In that asymptomatic knee, 63%, or 36 out of 57, have meniscus tears. That's a lot of tears with no symptoms. And remember, these are people who are only on average 43 years old. Other studies have found that as many as 76% of people over the age of 60 with no symptoms have, men have knee meniscus tears. That's an incredible amount of asymptomatic meniscus tears. The general findings, to summarize, is that knee meniscus tears can cause symptoms, but they don't always. As you get older, whether you have knee symptoms or not, meniscus tears become very common, and they get more common as you age. It's not so important to peg down a particular number of asymptomatic meniscus tears. The point is, the point that you have to know is that if you see a meniscus tear on an MRI, it doesn't necessarily say anything about whether or not that meniscus tear is going to be symptomatic or not. This is true for tears of all sizes. This shouldn't be surprising information for any healthcare provider who comes in contact with patients with knee issues, and it's certainly not controversial for anyone who has read the literature. And yet, and yet, you'd be surprised at how many times a patient with knee pain will get an MRI and there'll be a meniscus tear, and then all the focus becomes squarely focused on just that meniscus tear, and in certain cases, Immediately, surgery becomes discussed as the most likely and the, the best treatment option. This is madness. Madness. If you'd indulge me a brief story, I'd like to illustrate what we've been discussing together with a quick true story uh, about a patient of mine from several years ago. Yes? Okay, thank you. So, I was seeing this guy who was about 25 years old at the time for his back. I'd given him an injection uh, for a lumbar issue, 
And he was supposed to then go to physical therapy and then to come back for a follow-up in a month if the symptoms were still bothering him. And otherwise, he was just going to do to learn his home exercises from the therapist and then do his home exercises. Well, about six months later, he, came, he ended up coming back in to see me. And I asked him what he'd been up to, how he was doing. He told me that after the injection, his back had felt good. He'd gone to physical therapy and he was doing great. But then a month ago, he had been playing basketball when he twisted his knee. He had a lot of pain. He went to an urgent care clinic and they sent him to a local orthopedist who then got an MRI and that MRI showed a meniscus tear. Well, less than a week later, after the injury, the surgeon had operated on him because of the pain. Now, the patient's knee, when I saw him, was actually feeling great. This, this was about three weeks after the surgery. And the patient was coming to see me, not because of his knee, but because during the downtime, uh, with the injury and, and all the rest of it, his back had started to hurt again. And he wanted to get in front of the pain before it spiraled uh, out of control. So we ended up sending him back to physical therapy for his lower back issues, and he did great. Anyway, I asked him if his knee had been locking and catching after the basketball injury, and he said that it hadn't, but that it had been really painful. So, you know, from his perspective, he was really glad that he had gotten the surgery because now his knee didn't hurt anymore. So with all that, with all that we've been talking about before, what's wrong with the story? Or to put it more provocatively and how I really feel about it, what makes this story so outrageous and awful that years later, I'm telling it to you now as an example of medicine gone wrong? Basically, this kid, sorry, this man, everyone under 35 now seems like a kid to me. This man had an injury playing basketball. He had really bad knee pain. He got an MRI, showed a meniscus tear, and six days later, he had surgery, and after the surgery, his knee pain was dramatically improved. There's a quote that I like to tell patients and doctors alike. It's a quote that's uh, credited to Voltaire, who apparently said, the art, of medicine is en the art of medicine is entertaining patients while nature takes its course. That is, the body is able to heal itself a lot of the time if you'll just allow it a little bit of time and space to do it. So knowing what we know about asymptomatic meniscus tears, who's to say that this guy wouldn't have slowly gotten all better by himself in a couple of weeks and then been one of those many people with no knee pain but a meniscus tear on MRI? In fact, if I wanted to be really contrary, who's to say that the meniscus tear wasn't there before he twisted his knee in basketball? Maybe the twist just irritated a pre-existing tear. And even if the basketball game injury brought on the tear, and even if that tear was really, really painful, who's to say that he wouldn't have just gotten better with a little bit of time or with good conservative care like most people do? Now look, I know the orthopedist who did the surgery. Uh, he's a really good guy, and we're actually very friendly. And I don't believe at all that he operated on the patient just to pad his wallet or because he was being intellectually lazy or dishonest. But I was so upset after the patient left that I immediately called the orthopedist. We ended up talking at the end of the day because he was in the OR. But when we talked, we had a really tense uh, and frank conversation. And he genuinely thought the best thing to do for that patient was surgery. He pointed to a few things. He pointed to the facts of the injury causing the tear, uh, the tear causing the symptoms, and that the patient's symptoms resolved post-surgery. And besides, in his mind, and I think this was a big point in his mind, fixing the tear was good for the long-term health of the knee because, in his words, the tear wouldn't then lead to a bigger tear or other arthritic changes. These were his thoughts. But as I explained to him, he was so wrong on so many important points. Now, the injury may have caused the tear, and the tear was likely causing his symptoms. We could agree on those points. But then why not give him a chance of good conservative therapy knowing that this would usually work even if it may have taken another week or two or even four for the symptoms to get all better. Well, that's where the orthopedist then fell back on his belief that it was better to have the tear surgically repaired uh, anyway for the long-term health of the knee. But there's actually very good data to think that doing surgery on the tear accelerates the arthritic process. It doesn't prevent it. Once you go in surgically, you inevitably affect the normal architecture of the knee. One often cited study out of the large osteoarthritis initiative study showed that patients who had knee meniscus arthroscopic surgery were more likely to go on to develop knee osteoarthritis 
compared with age-matched peers who had meniscus tears and who did not receive any surgical intervention. So we had that, we had that conversation together. When I got off the phone, I honestly wasn't sure I'd converted the surgeon to my viewpoints, but I did get off the phone much more committed than ever to the prospect of the importance of disseminating good, responsible information and good, responsible data on these sorts of things to doctors, to other healthcare providers, and to patients alike. Okay, let's rewind. We've seen so far that the meniscus is an important part of the knee that acts as a sort of cushion for the knee. We've also seen that it's commonly torn, and often those tears don't lead to symptoms. Further from my story, you can see that there's some disagreement in the clinical community about what to do with patients who have knee pain and meniscus tears. This is one of the reasons, again, that it's so important for patients to have a good understanding of what a meniscus tear is, what its implications are, and what your treatment options are, so you know what you can and should be doing about it so that you can be a good advocate for yourself. Okay, so when it is symptomatic, how does a meniscus tear in a patient typically present? First of all, there are two basic types of presentation. One, one is an acute injury. This is usually in a young person who is playing some sort of sport or who suffers an acute injury and tears the meniscus. The mechanism of injury is usually obvious in this presentation. There was no pain, then there was some sort of injury, and then there was pain. Now the other sort of presentation is much more gradual. Often there was no identifiable injury, but rather the pain just slowly starts over time. The patient's usually older than 50 in this scenario, though sometimes the patient can be considerably younger. The person may have first noted that they noticed that their knee was getting achy with long car rides, it would hurt with longer walks or jogs, uh, the pain became present even with longer uh, walks or with climbing stairs, kneeling or squatting often made the pain worse. Um, a classic symptom with a meniscus tear is clicking, catching, or locking of the knee. This isn't always present, but when it is present, it's strongly suggestive of a meniscus issue. When the knee locks, what this means is that it gets stuck, and you can't easily unlock the knee to move it. If the knee won't unlock at all, then this can be a surgical emergency. Often, though, this, the knee slowly does unlock as you massage your knee and you gently stretch it out. Speaking from personal experience, I tore my meniscus a long time ago, and I've had my knee lock several times. And honestly, I've had lots of injuries through the years uh, from sports and other mishaps, and knee locking is definitely one of my least favorite. What I tell patients is that if they aren't sure if their knee is locked, then it hasn't locked. Knee locking is generally going to be exquisitely uncomfortable and painful. On physical examination, a hallmark finding in patients with symptomatic meniscus tears is joint line tenderness on the side of the knee where the pain is. Usually, if the medial meniscus is torn and painful, then the inside of the knee will be the most painful and the inside or the medial joint line will be tender. Likewise, if the lateral meniscus is torn and painful, the outside of the knee will be the most painful and the outside or the lateral joint line will be tender. Now that said, it's not uncommon for the entire knee to be painful with either a medial or a lateral meniscus tear. But even in these cases, often the joint line will be tender on examination. There are also provocative maneuvers that doctors often perform as part of their physical examination in order to try and elicit meniscus pain in their patients. These include such tests as Apley's compression and distraction test uh, and McMurray's test as common ones. The trouble with provocative maneuvers for meniscus tear, and this includes all of the, the provocative maneuvers uh, from the, the self-diagnosis maneuvers that I've seen promoted online, is that they're extremely lacking in specificity for diagnosing meniscus tears. That is, they may be positive, but there isn't a ton of information that we can necessarily garner from the maneuvers because they can also be positive in people with other kinds of knee problems, or even sometimes they can be positive in people with no knee pain at all, but the maneuver just happens to elicit pain anyway. Now, on a quick related side note uh, to this point, about 15 years ago, fresh out of fellowship, I wrote a book on physical examination maneuvers for musculoskeletal diagnosis. I got so into the weeds on the examinations, you would have thought that I could diagnose anything through a careful physical examination. 
However, around the same time, I was also co-editing a musculoskeletal review journal, and some of the studies that were being submitted to us uh, that we were reviewing were reviews of the literature about physical exams, and they continued to show the relative uh, lack of efficacy of these diagnostic examination maneuvers. So sadly, I came to learn more and more that the sensitivity and specificity of most of the diagnostic examination tests that we learn and perform in our training and in the office are just not very good. That's not to say they aren't sometimes worth doing, and indeed, I often still do them. The examination maneuvers can help to point us in a direction for a diagnosis, and of course, some maneuvers are certainly more useful than others, so it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. But the point here is that it's important to not think that a fancy test for a diagnosis, just because it has a fancy name and has been around for a while, is a test that we can necessarily rely on to arrive at a diagnosis. We have to be mindful to look at all of these, these diagnostic maneuvers as one more piece of the diagnostic puzzle. Anyway, back to meniscus tears in particular. When it comes to meniscus tears, it turns out, unfortunately, that all of our specialty diagnostic tests are just not particularly accurate. They can help rule out other diagnoses, but they can't give you a definitive diagnosis of a meniscus tear that you can then hang your hat on. When it comes to diagnostic imaging tests, an MRI is going to be the best diagnostic imaging tool to evaluate for a meniscus tear. Importantly, an MRI can miss small meniscus tears. An MR arthrogram, in which contrast dye is injected into the joint, and then an MRI is taken, can detect smaller tears than without contrast dye, but even that can miss some tears. The gold standard diagnostic, at the end of the day, is actually direct visualization through arthroscopy, as in through a surgical arthroscopy, where direct inspection can look at the meniscus and see if there's a tear. But doing an arthroscopy as a pure diagnostic uh, procedure without the intention of also performing surgery is almost never done. So let's go back to more useful clinical information that you'll actually encounter in, real, in the real world, in real life. The way we typically identify the great majority of knee meniscus tears is with an MRI. But as we've talked about in some depth now, many people will have knee meniscus tears that don't cause symptoms. So how do you know for sure if your meniscus tear is causing your knee symptoms? Well, that's a good question, right? Yes, thank you. That is, in fact, the central question that we have to answer in a person with knee pain and a meniscus tear, right? a knee pain with a meniscus tear. And the answer is, unfortunately, not going to make you very happy. The honest answer is that we don't really know for sure, but we can be pretty sure. We can be sure in our mind that we know what's going on, but statistically, the best we can do is put all of the pieces together and feel confident that we're probably correct in our assessment. So we have to hold on to some humility, which is sometimes not the easiest thing for us doctors to do. So we use the MRI as one important piece of our diagnosis, but it's not the only piece. Now, if a patient has a clinical history and a physical examination that's more or less in line with a meniscus tear, and then they also have a big meniscus tear in the MRI, then we're pretty sure we have the right diagnosis. Pretty sure to the point where I would put good money on it, but I wouldn't bet money that I couldn't afford to lose. Now, consider a slightly different scenario. Consider someone that has pain around the patella, also known as the kneecap. And that pain is worse with standing, walking, climbing and going downstairs, squatting, uh, and let's say going on long car rides. Of note, the person doesn't have any locking or catching of the knee. And on examination, everything is basically normal except there's a lot of tenderness in and around the patella. And let's say that we got an MRI of this person and the MRI was normal except it shows a significant medial meniscus tear. Well, in this situation, I would say that this person has patellofemoral pain syndrome until proven otherwise, because patellofemoral pain syndrome is a clinical diagnosis and not a radiographic one. And the clinical history and the examination is most consistent with that. And so even in the presence of a meniscus tear, even a large one, we would still stay with that patellofemoral syndrome diagnosis. Now let's take the situation of someone with a clinical history and physical exam that's consistent with a meniscus tear and an MRI that shows a medial meniscus tear, or it could be a lateral meniscus tear, it really doesn't matter. 
We know that a tear can be painful or that it cannot be painful, but why is that? It's not just the size of the tear. Some large tears don't hurt at all, and some really small tears are really painful. So what then makes one tear painful and one identical looking tear not painful? This is a question we used to ask residents and fellows in their first month of training with us, and almost none of them got it right the first time. But here's the answer. The reason why one tear becomes painful and one doesn't is a function of whether or not the body responds to that tear with an inflammatory response. If there's inflammation, there will be pain. If there's no inflammatory response, or if the inflammatory response has resolved, then there won't be pain. It's pretty simple, right? But what then is inflammation? Well, inflammation is a protein response, but the best way to think of it is that it's like a fire. And there are two ways of putting out a fire. One is to clear away the fodder and allow the fire to die down on its own. Surgically, this means to remove and or repair the tear. Non-surgically, this primarily means therapeutic exercises to stretch and strengthen the muscles that are surrounding and supporting the knee to take the pressure off of the joint and allow the tear inside the joint time and space to heal, allow the inflammation to heal. How do the exercises work in real life? Well, think of this. When you take a step, you have a heel strike, and then the force comes up from the ground through your heel, through your foot, through your ankle, through your knee, on its way to your hip and spine. And as the force travels through you, your muscles can either contract or they cannot contract. The more your muscles contract and the more effectively they contract, the more they can absorb that force from the ground. If the muscles around your knee are weak or they're imbalanced or they don't contract properly, well, guess what? Your knee joint can't get out of the way. So the force from the ground will then go more through the knee joint. So the better your muscles support your joints, the more your muscles and not your knee can absorb the pressures of everyday life and protect your joints. With the knee, you can find the best exercises for meniscus tears in our video on exercises for meniscus tears, or you can work with a great physical therapist. Essentially, the right exercises are going to be about strengthening your quadriceps, strengthening your hip abductors, your hip, strengthening your hip extensors, and stretching your quadriceps, your hip flexors, and your hamstrings, and your calves. Often, doing the right exercises is going to be enough to unload the knee and allow it to heal. When it's not, or when the pain is just too intense so the person can't even do the exercises because it just hurts too much, then they may need to use a fire hose to put out the fire. There are a few options for a fire hose. You can take oral anti-inflammatories, such as over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs like Advil or Aleve, or prescription strength NSAIDs like Celebrex, Duexis, Vimovo, Mobic. You can take supplements like bromelain, curcumin, or tart cherries. Unfortunately for this approach, very little of any oral medication is going to reach the knee joint. So when it comes to pain coming from inside the knee joint, oral medications are primarily used for pain control, although there is an overall anti-inflammatory effect from them. Topical anti-inflammatories, such as topical diclofenac, which is like a topical Advil, can also be used. Topical medications, both over-the-counter and prescription strength ones like Pensed, work really, really well for more superficial injuries, such as bruises, tendonitis, ligament sprains, uh, or hand and feet injuries, where there's not so much soft tissue for the medication to have to diffuse through. But still, some people find topical anti-inflammatories really helpful even for deeper intraarticular knee pathologies like a meniscus tear. And there's really very little downside to trying a topical NSAID, so I tend to be a fan of using them as an adjunctive treatment, assuming, of course, no contraindications in the patient. The most effective modality to put water on the fire is to take a needle and place the medication directly at the site of inflammation. There are two common injections that are used for meniscus tear inflammation and pain. But first, a word on injections for the knee. It's important to note that intraarticular knee injections should always be performed using ultrasound guidance in order to ensure the proper and safe placement of the needle. Now, when I started doing knee injections, almost everyone did them blindly, which is to say that we use only our palpation to know where to start the injection. 
It seemed like such an easy injection, and you'd be very hard-pressed to find doctors, let alone specialists, who thought that they ever missed the target in a knee injection. However, then ultrasound machines started becoming smaller, their image quality got better, they became less expensive. And as all of these things happened, more and more research was performed to look at the pros and cons of using ultrasound guidance for various procedures, including intraarticular knee injections. And these research studies coming out were showing again and again that blind injections missed the intraarticular knee space by as much as 30% of the time, no matter who was doing them and no matter how much experience that specialist had. These were humbling data points, but they were reproduced over and over. Now, I've done as many knee injections as almost any doctor alive. I used to teach knee injection procedures at conferences. I would frankly be dumbfounded to learn that I had ever personally missed a blind knee injection. But if you believe it all in science, if you believe it all in learning and evolving, evolving as a person, as a professional, and as a society, and I believe in all of those things, then we have to put our egos aside, which is as hard for me as for anyone else, and we have to appreciate that we all must be missing blind intraarticular knee injections by about 30% of the time. That's three in 10 knee injections that feel great in terms of the specialist thinking it was a perfect injection, but when in fact they aren't properly placed when they're done without image guidance. So 12 years ago or so, I put my ego aside and I started using ultrasound guidance for every knee injection I ever did. If you, if you use image guidance, then you can be absolutely certain that your injection is done safely and placed properly every single time, which gives it the best chance of success. It befuddles me that there are still knee injections being performed out there in the world without image guidance. And these are being done by well-intentioned but just misinformed doctors. So for your knee, make sure your doctor is one of the doctors who knows to use ultrasound guidance for your knee injection. Okay, with that point made about knee injections, let's return to talking about the two most common types of medications that can be injected for meniscus tear pain and inflammation. The first type is an intraarticular steroid injection. Steroids are a strong anti-inflammatory medication. An advantage of a steroid injection is that it usually starts working pretty quickly. The medication has to be metabolized to start to work, and that can take a day or two, uh, maybe three, to start to work, and then it usually crescendos over the course of about two weeks. Another advantage of a steroid injection is that a steroid injection usually works pretty well. A disadvantage is that steroids aren't native to the knee, so that means that they really don't belong there. And if they're repeated too many times, they can have a negative impact on the cartilage in the joint. That said, generally, as long as you space steroid injections in the knee by three months or more, it should be okay. But there are lots of variables that go into the decision tree of if, when, and how many steroid injections to use. Generally, if a steroid injection is used, it should be thought of as a window of opportunity during which the inflammation and pain are greatly reduced, and this then allows a person to focus on their therapeutic exercises so that they can tweak the biomechanics so that as the steroids wear off, which they typically will in about three months, the inflammation and the pain doesn't return. The second type of medication that can be injected is viscosupplementation. This is basically an injection series of joint fluid or hyaluronic acid. This is sometimes compared to being like an oil change for your joint. Or another way to think of it is that uh, the meniscus tear is like a pothole in the road and the visco supplementation joint fluid injections are like paving over the pothole. The advantage of visco supplementation injections is that you're putting a fluid into the joint that actually belongs in the joint. So it's a more organic way of treating the joint. The fluid helps nourish and lubricate the joint and it's, it's basically an overall net positive for the joint. The main disadvantages of visco supplementation is that it's generally a series of one, three, four, or five injections depending on the particular visco supplementation product that's used. Most visco supplementation products these days are a series of three injections that are spaced one week apart. Um, also, the visco supplementation often takes a few weeks to start to work, uh, to start to work and to take away the inflammation and the pain. 
So in someone who's dealing with lots of debilitating pain, having to wait one to three weeks, or sometimes it can take as long as five weeks for the fluid to work can be a very, very long time to wait. And finally, the lubricant lasts for about six months before the pain often returns, and then the injection series can be repeated. So again, as with steroid injections, ideally the visco supplementation injections here are used as a window of opportunity in order to allow the patient again to perform, to learn and then perform their therapeutic exercises to tweak the biomechanics so that the inflammation and the pain never return. Sometimes if a patient is in lots of debilitating pain, you might want to combine a steroid injection with the visco supplementation. The advantage of this is that the steroids can offer a quick relief from the pain and inflammation, and then the visco supplementation basically paves the pothole, lubricates, nourishes the joint, and can offer a longer lasting uh, relief and a larger window of opportunity. But note that no matter what injection is used, if it is used, it should always be thought of as a window of opportunity that allows for the therapeutic exercises. If all you do is injections and don't follow through with the exercises, even if the pain goes away and stays away, you're missing an opportunity to help bulletproof the knee against future injury, inflammation, and pain. There are other injection possibilities. One of them uh, is Toradol. Toradol is a liquid NSAID. It's sort of like a, you can think of it like a liquid Advil. The advantage of this as a joint injection is that it works reasonably well and it's not bad for the joint. The disadvantage is that it doesn't work as well as a steroid injection. Still, if you have a patient with lots of pain in the knee who can't have a steroid injection for whatever reason, but needs more urgent relief, and if they are a candidate for a liquid NSAID injection, then an ultrasound-guided intraarticular toradol injection in the knee is a reasonable option to consider. Another set of possible injection procedures belong under the heading of regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is an exciting and evolving field of medicine. There are lots of specific techniques that go under the heading of this field that are all trying to prove that they're the best techniques. technique. One of the most common and favored types is something called PRP, or platelet-rich plasma. Now in this procedure, the patient's blood is aspirated, and then the blood is spun down in a specialized centrifuge in order to isolate the patient's platelets and the platelet growth factors. Then these platelets and their growth factors are injected back into this, the site of pathology, the patient's pathology. In this case, it would be into the knee. And the hope is that this injectate stimulates the body's own innate healing mechanisms to be activated, which then heal the problem. Now, other regenerative medicine techniques, all of which seek to stimulate the body's own healing properties, include bone marrow aspirate, prolotherapy, amniotic fluid injections, and, and there are others. The primary problems with regenerative medicine is twofold. One problem is the relative lack of standardized research supporting its usage. And related to this problem is that as a result of the scarcity of good, high quality, reproducible research, regenerative medicine techniques are almost never covered by insurance companies, and they can be very expensive, generally ranging from $750 to as much as $3,000 or more, dollars, depending on the specific doctor and the specific regenerative medicine technique that's being considered. So you can see that cost can clearly be a prohibitive factor for this sort of procedure. But regenerative medicine techniques are still an option, and they are worth at least discussing with your doctor. And finally, surgery is, of course, an option for meniscus tears. Surgery for a meniscus tear is arthroscopic. The downtime after the surgery depends, but it's generally pretty quick. Most patients can return to all of their normal activities within a few weeks. If there was a repair of the meniscus instead of uh, the tear just being removed, then recovery is going to take a little bit longer, which allows the repaired meniscus time to heal. Uh, and that can be as long as three months. Sometimes after an arthroscopic surgery for meniscus tear, you'll have your weight bearing uh, to be restricted and you may need to be wearing a brace as well. Post-operative pain is typically pretty minimal. Not all surgeons are going to recommend physical therapy after arthroscopic surgery for a meniscus tear, but personally, I would suggest always planning on doing 
uh, at least some physical therapy and learning and doing your therapeutic exercises once you're cleared by your surgeon to do so, if for no other reason than to strengthen the muscles that support your knee, which will then make a recurrent tear less likely, as well as to make any injury to your knee in general less likely in the future. Now, in some cases of a degenerative tear, if there's a lot of background arthritis, then arthroscopic surgery might no longer be an option, and you may need to consider a knee replacement surgery if surgery is going to be pursued. This is obviously a much larger surgery and accordingly deserves a more sober assessment. And finally, in younger patients who have finished growing but don't have arthritis in their knee, a meniscus replacement can be considered. This procedure is also called a meniscal allograft transplantation. The allograft tissue that's used comes from a cadaver. The hope here is that if surgery is required, then this type of surgery might help prevent the development of future osteoarthritis, which we know can otherwise be a risk with surgeries for meniscus tears. Recovery from a meniscus uh, transplant is generally about a month or two, but you may need to stay away from strenuous sports for as long as a year. In younger patients with difficult cases who may need surgery, this is an option that certainly can be considered as part of the conversation between you and your doctor. Okay, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this video on knee meniscus tears. Uh, I know we got pretty heavily in, into the weeds. Um, if you have enjoyed this video, and if you've learned something, then please remember to like this video, uh, subscribe to the channel, and tell a friend who might enjoy it as well, because that's the way that we can spread good health information and achieve good health outcomes together. As always, if you have questions or comments for me, you can reach me at Dr. Cooper at PrincetonSJC.com, or feel free to leave a question or a comment in the comment section. Thank you very much.